Well, first of all, it's great to be here. I'm trying to figure out if there's anybody in the back row up there. Um, I think it's a little empty, but, um, but thank you so much for having me. I'm super excited to be here. I've uh, spoken at Startup uh, Grind before, but never to an audience this big. Uh, and somewhere in, in the audience, I'm not going to expose him, but uh, my first cousin is here from London, who flew all the way from London to be a part of this. So, uh, so excited to be here with you. Um, I think I have 10 minutes, so I'm going to get started. Uh, the topic, I think, of, at hand today is what I call Diary of a CEO, and more aptly, Founder CEO. How do you start to think about scaling yourself and your teams? And I think some of the principles I'm going to go through, there's seven key principles I want to talk about. And I think they apply whether you have five employees, 10 employees, 25 employees, or 100. Um, but how is it you think about making that journey? And so the first thing I want to talk about, um, I'm waiting for my slides to shift. Let's see if we can get them up. Can we get, oh, there we go. Uh, let me go back a slide. The first way to think about um, this is I want to challenge the conventional thinking on founders and CEOs. Um, so I've presented here a kind of a visual image of how people think about this, right? The common wisdom is the founder is in the weeds, the founder is the entrepreneur and has all the product vision, and then there's the CEO all the way up there, right, who's really good at executive management and board management and vision, and this is the journey. Now, if you're, it's sort of, if you're a founder, you're thinking, how do I stay in the CEO seat? Right? How is my company scales? Do I scale too? And of course, that's a vision for all of us who are founders, right? You know, if we want to lead our companies to greatness, what does that look like? So let's, let's think about the model I use to think about that journey. I call it operating range, and it's a very different principle. It's a principle about managing your energy as both a founder and a CEO, and knowing when to play which part. And that is the fundamental essence, I think, of making the transition from founder to CEO. And so the way I think about it is, look, there are a bunch of things you have to do right to reach your, lead, your, lead your company. And if you look at some of the things on the, on the right, they run from board management to talent management to metrics management. If you look in the left, evangelizing, right, evangelizing your story, product strategy, product development. But interestingly, whether you're a founder or CEO, there are times you need to be in the weeds, and there are times you need to be at 10,000 feet or 100,000 feet. So really, I think about the model for all of you, and even for myself, as operating on this dimension and then on this dimension, right? So let's talk specifically about what that looks like. What are the seven things I think about on my entrepreneurship journey, on my executive journey, and what are the things I think you should be thinking about too? So number one, put up your hand in this room if you know your trademark strength. Okay, so just for a gauge for everybody else, that was about 15% of the room. So let's just pause for a minute. You are a founder. You are building a company. At the center of that company is you. How can you possibly lead others and know what kind of a team to build if you don't know what you are quintessentially great at? And of course, also, where you're not so great. So here's a couple practical tips. If you don't know what your trademark strengths are, ask the people around you. Right? If you don't have that much work experience, Ask people you, 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 you know, were at college with. Ask people who were your professors. Ask your high school teacher. Right? Ask your parents. <laughs> For those of you who are much younger than me, ask your parents. Um, but the reality here is, if you don't know your trademark strength, I will posit that it is impossible to build a company around you with any kind of self-awareness at all. ABR, always be recruiting. What's one number one job of a founder CEO? Recruiting. And when I say recruiting, I don't mean recruiting just for the jobs you have open. I mean recruiting for the jobs you don't have open. I mean always be recruiting. Right. What's the number one characteristic of you know, startups that thrive? They have great talent. They have the right talent at the right time for the right problems, right? But who do you think is the quintessential recruiter? Now, lots of people hate recruiting because it is about the art of selling. But in fact, nobody can sell your vision like you can. So I see a lot of people who want to leave this to a recruiter if they can, or somebody on their team. But at the end of the day, as a CEO, I, I would say that the number one thing you need to do, whether you're the found, you have your founder hat on or your CEO hat on, is to always be recruiting. Um, so this principle is a really important one to me. So a lot of people struggle with how to scale, right? They really struggle with sort of how do I make that journey uh, and get the most out of my team and myself. So I have one principle I talk about with my team. It's very simple. You manage me or I manage you. 
what would you prefer? How many of you as CEOs want to be in the business of actively managing every single person on your team to deliver their results? How many of you would like to be managed? Anybody else here beside me like to be managed? Yeah. You know why I like to be managed? Here's what being managed looks like. It means I walk into a room and somebody has already prepared the deck to show me how they're thinking about it. Right? It means they send me the deck the night before. It means they have an agenda. So you probably have had all of five minutes with me. How many of you think I'm capable of walking into a room and not having an opinion on a subject? as the founder CEO. So you have two choices. Oh, you think I'm not capable? Thank you. Um, most people don't say that about me. But, but just think about this. Think about the two mental models here. If we walk into a room and you're going to be brainstorming with the CEO or the founder, and you have an opinionated founder CEO, and I would posit there's not a single founder that's not pretty darn opinionated, right? No matter what package it comes in, by the way, right? It doesn't need to be as overt as mine. So my, my point to you is, would you rather rock into that room with that person with no vision or some vision? Now think about this even as it applies to your board, which we're going to talk about in a moment. The reality is, I always say to people, if you walk in that room with no vision, you're walking out with my vision. Not because it's the right vision. Because in the absence of vision, what's a founder going to do or a CEO? They're going to fill in. And they're going to tell you what the vision is if you don't spend some time telling them. So how do you get the most out of your employees? You want to teach your employees how to manage you. I say to people, this is what it takes to work with me, right? But manage me. I'm happy to be managed. There's nothing I like better than walking into a room where somebody has done the work and has an opinion. And I can guarantee those are the people who walk out of the room and both leave me the ability to scale and go off and do other things. And nine times out of 10, it's probably their vision, not mine. So this, this is a really important principle. How does this translate to those of you who have boards? Anybody in the room already have venture funding and have a board? Some of you, none of you, a few of you. OK, so let's just, for those of you who will be fundraising, let's take this principle one further. So in the dynamic with the board, who's managing who? Do you want your investors managing you, or do you want to manage your investors? Thank you. Right answer. So think of yourself as the CEO or the founder CEO in the center, where you want to be managed, and upwardly, you're managing your investors, right? Because Classically, your investors want to be managed too. How many of you think your investors want to be in a boardroom where you are brainstorming with them the vision of the company? Would you rather walk in with a vision and have them respond and give you feedback? This is how you start to think about teams. All right, next topic. All of you, saw, does everybody in here have at least one employee, somebody they're working with? Most people starting to? Okay, let's start to think about how you work with other people. This is called energy grain, gainers and energy drainers. Anybody have any kind of sense of who on your teams give you energy and who drains, you ener drains your energy? Yes, yes. These are the things you need to start to think about. I know you guys have listened this morning to things like how to build great teams, what to do in toxic situations. I always call energy gain and energy drain for a CEO and founder about thinking about how do you do more of the things that give you energy and how do you less of the things that take away energy, right? Including, are you managing people who drain your energy or give you energy? Of course, this is very highly related to the thing I just talked about before, right? If you spend a lot of time managing somebody, you know, I would just ask you, do you have the right person? It doesn't mean you don't manage, but where you manage is important, right? I find that all my energy drains when I'm managing at the micro level. That doesn't mean, by the way, as a founder, I don't have to dig in at 10, at 10 feet or at 5 feet or at 1 foot if that's what it takes. Because sometimes problems require you to just roll up your sleeves and figure it out and not leave it to anybody else. It's not all what I'm suggesting. But you want to be spending your energy on solving the problem, not managing the person who is the problem. Um, heads up versus heads down. So one of the most important things in making the journey from founder to CEO is thinking about when you need to be heads up and when you need to be heads down. Any ideas what I mean by this? How many of you think it's enough to build a great company if you just put your head down and do your work? As a CEO, you are expected to know when to lift your head up and look out and let go of what's going on inside the office. Because if you don't go out and figure out the macro conditions, whether that's fundraising, whether that's talent recruitment, if you don't pause on all this stuff, you're not going to be even, you're not even going to be in a position to deliver a company. Because you have to make sure your company survives to thrive, right? So one of the most important principles, I think, is heads up and heads down. 
So heads down to me is, look, what is the mode at which you need to be looking at the product you need to deliver next week? Heads up is when you say to your team, you guys deliver the product for next week. Right now I need to go out and find us some investors. Because every moment I spend here is a moment I'm not spending there. So I'd ask you, ask you, for those of you who are thinking about making this transition and how you think about scaling yourself, heads up, heads down. If you want to be in control of your own destiny, you need to know when to do which. So there's one last principle I want to talk to you about. I'm down to eight seconds, by the way. Um, and this one is an important one. Find your priest. Claim your religion. Anybody know what I mean by this in terms of being a founder CEO? What do you think I mean? Close. So you're talking about a mentor. When I say free priest, I mean somebody who's your confessional. Somebody whom, to whom you can go and say, oh my God, I just did this. What do you think? Now, uh, second question. Is your priest your spouse or significant other or girlfriend or boyfriend? Are they your board or your investor? Why not? <laughs> so you've got a couple different things going on. First of all, um, and I say it, I'm married 12 years. Hopefully I go another 12. But the reality is if I put on my husband the burden of listening to every single thing that went on with Joyous and now the board list, which is my second startup, I mean, I don't know what would happen. He has not paid enough money to listen to me bitch 24 hours a day when really what he needs is a partner. Right. Conversely, my board... Look, I'm happy, to, I'm happy to take feedback from my board. I want to be in a constructive dialogue about the issues I'm struggling with. I'm not sure I want to go to the board and confess that there are times I don't know what I'm doing. Right? Or I have self-doubt. Right? That's not for your board to hear either. So my, if you do nothing else, whether you find a peer group of CEOs, whether you join YPO, whether you have you know, drinks one evening with your best friend, whether you pay someone, which, was, which is what I do. I've had a coach for eight years. Go find your priest. <laughs> that is the single most important person on this journey with you. I mean, they're so important. Sometimes a co-founder can be that. Sometimes they can't, quite frankly. It depends what role they're in playing in your company. And when I say claim your religion, the last key essence here before I wrap up comes all the way back to the beginning, right? When I say claim your religion, know what you are and know what you're not because you're about to build an entire company on it. So if you are passionate and opinionated, and you can't help but have an opinion when you walk in the room, well, prepare your teams for that. When you recruit people, tell them that. You know, the notion of knowing your identity is so, as a CEO is so much more important as a CEO and for a company than not having an identity and being afraid to claim it. So the last image I want to leave, leave you with is this. Right? So you think back to that journey I talked about, the founder-CEO journey that goes this way and goes this way, and you're always managing on that range. The last image I want to keep you in mind for you is drafting. As a CEO, your biggest job is to draft. Who are you drafting in front of? Your team. Who else are you drafting in front of? Your board. Why are you drafting? Your job is to be out in front and to make sure they are following behind you. Right? So every time you go through kind of effectively this journey, and by the way, it's like you understand it's an infinity loop, right? You just keep going on the same journey. Like it's not up and to the right. It's a cycle of its own. It's a sine wave of its own, right? You want to keep advancing, right, on that journey with every one of those principles I talked about. And right behind you, you want your team drafting and filling in the space right where you've been. The most lonely place for a CEO is to be way out in front and have the team way behind. Trust me, I know, right? The most important place to be is to be 10 steps ahead and knowing that your team is learning from you and drafting right behind you and you're capable of recruiting the people who can draft with you the entire way. Thank you very much, and hopefully you guys have a great afternoon.